okay. This is for criticism detox, so if you're not in for criticism detox, you might be in the wrong room. So uh, please, uh, may I have a warm greeting for Mr. Rad Perkin. Uh, 
you cannot kill dynamic commands like uh, up this interface or uh, shut down this interface. But um, there's automatic logic, right? Like when automatically does something with interface popping up and going away, wasn't very convincing enough um, for these distributions to adopt it in that in that algorithm, which I find find pretty handy. We are working on actually adding this uh, interactive interface as well, so that we can actually afford that. Or uh, uh, the EFR balance scripts of the virus. Um, another success we have is Antspawn. I'm not sure if you know um, Antspawn. Antspawn is a component of Sysme. It's something like a, a minimal container manager. And it's not so, like, I mean, it sounds a lot like it was something like Docker, but it's really not. Um, like Docker focuses on microservices, like where basically each container has, has a, 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 it's exactly one service. Um, where Zspawn is really focused, it's really on a, uh, uh, running containers where every single container has its own operating system inside it. Where operating system inside it, it, it is not the PMC, but actually the PLE1 that is actually two thirds of the main PLE1, uh, for example, system B. Um, uh, this is actually being used uh, nowadays as, as backend for core OS rockets, which is kind of cool. Um, given like Hemsport or something, we primarily created um, to actually test system B for ourselves, right? Because if you if you have system B um, and you want to um, test the boot up, you can, of course, always do a hard boot up with your physical hardware. And then you waste a lot of time because you always watch the screen while the virus runs through and these kind of things. So um, we started um, uh, while developing system B and doing this stuff with virtualization, KVM, and things like that. And that's what, much better, but uh, you, it's still very hard to debug because you can actually not touch a device that needs to be to, to um, the inner process of the virtual machine unless the debugger also runs on the virtual machine. So um, we created Xcom for that purpose, which is like a minimal content manager that allows us to, it's like Chirut and steroids, right? Um, uh, Chirut and steroids, where it's actually capable of running a full operating system inside. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's similar to Docker, but it's totally not like Docker. Um, and it's part of the basic operating system, and how we test our stuff, how we build our stuff. And it's going to build it already for a lot of other things like that. Uh, what's also interesting is that some of the more auxiliary components of system D, like uh, um, for an Android D, we decided that, well, um, we didn't want to just glue something together on existing components um, that match or don't match uh, some of those together. We saw that we did it properly, right? And so um, for an Android D, we created this uh, little small library, which is DHCP. DHCP, um, of course, is a, it's actually a very typical protocol. It's basically, you have five messages where you say, I want an IP address, um, that somebody says, I can offer you this IP address, and somebody says, I want this IP address, and then you get it, you have the IP address now, and then there's one to, to uh, get out of here. So, um, it's really, it works in most different protocols um, days, and we decided, okay, we don't want to split everything together, but the FCP, I have a credit for the called FCP. Um, it's not really public, but it's supposed to be public one day, um, and it's what never is based on. Um, so after we did that, then the number of manager people saw, okay, and it's kind of cool that they're just trying to get into the library that just does the DHCP without it. Yeah. Um, and they actually decided to integrate that too. Which I find particularly amazing given the fact that it's not actually public about it yet, right? Like it's, uh, we don't come into a state live API yet, um, we don't even export it yet. And if you want to use it, you have to, as you can take the source, it uh, incorporates it into your code. So it's kind of cool that that uh, um, yeah, well, a lot of before we even saw it public. Making anybody interested. Um, okay, um, something uh, we have been working on in the last year, you know, which is going to come up in the best distributions, like it's a completely different topic now, is a unified and perfect hierarchy. I'm not sure if, it's, like, I presume that not everybody in this room even knows what uh, control groups are supposed to be. Um, a little bit of background on that, uh, there's very technical stuff. Um, it's basically, um, on Linux, um, you want to be able to uh, manage resources of the group process, uh, processes in an efficient way. Like, for example, you have Apache and MySQL installed on one machine. You want to make sure that uh, Apache gets this much, this much memory at most, um, and runs on CCPUs and gets this much CPU at most, and then you want to be, uh, set I.O. and things like that. And for, that's what you want to do for Apache, and then you want to do something different for MySQL, right? 
um, uniform, uh, like the control group stuff is something that uh, Sysity is very much based on. Basically, everything that Sysity manages is maintained in one of these control groups. Control groups are a kernel concept. It's exposed to space in a, in a file system. Um, nothing weird in that. Um, um, yeah, control groups are horrible. Like they used to be. Um, it's uh, one of those kernel interfaces that we have had to build on for Sysity because they not only do this resource management for us, but they also do the the grouping, the general management of uh, um, service processes and service runtimes. Um, but they were horrible because they they were completely chaotic. Like people working on the various parts of resource management in it um, didn't always let's say cooperate the way they should have been, so that they had very different semantics. Now, um, in, the, in, the, in the past year, so in the last three years or something, Jim Hill, like that guy, has been working on uh, fixing all that in the kernel. And uh, for that to create something which is called the unified um, control group variety. The difference um, towards the old stuff being that uh, instead of having separate um, uh, organizational trees, how these resources are man managed depending on the type of resource, right? So that you would have one tree for CPU management, one for CPU time management, one for um, IO management, uh, one for um, CPU binding management, and so on. He decided, okay, um, we'll just have one. Because after all, the operating system kind of wants to manage one variety, not many, and these varieties are not going to be um, independent, they're not going to be orthogonal anyway. So the result of that is a new kind of variety. It's a very low level of thing. You will get it contacted with you. Uh, with it, uh, if, you, if you are an administrator and then look at the details a little bit further, because it is actually exposed to various places in the operating system. Um, yeah, we adopted that in um, uh, like the old one um, since day one, and the new one since last year. Um, it's going to be turned on in distribution very soon. Um, it will break six because the uh, unified control variety is something you can you can choose if you want the old one or the new one, but you have to choose. And if you pick the new one, then the old software will not work. One of the old software that might not work is a pretty popular little program called Docker. Uh, because they uh, they um, tend to directly access these devices. Anyway, I'm sorry short. Um, it's all going to be different. All all going to be much much better with the new the unified control variety. But it's going to break out by the system. Um, at least uh, the products actually which actually affect the system. The net result of that is um, for the first time we get really clean notifications when the service actually. Uh, runs and ends. We got uh, um, fully integrated resource management on every level, right? Like we provide that already to some level of system so that you can add runtime, readjust the um, resource management of any service you run. But it's going to be much more complete and nicer. Yeah. Now I talked. Uh, oh yeah. Well, one thing like a lot of the unified control group variety that we're going to do that is already in place actually support for the PMEs control. Uh, it's a really basic thing actually. It allows you put a limit on the number of processes that a specific service can, can run, right? So you can basically say that Apache shall be able to run 200 processes, and MySQL shall be able to run 20 processes, so that they um, try to force some more and look at an error. Some absolutely basic, and it kind of is, and uh, it's kind of weird that it took up to 20, uh, 15, 20 years in the kernel. Yeah, another thing is that it's, um, the CMU stuff is going to be safe for the first time for delegation. What does that mean? It basically means that even if you use these more complex things like resolve controllers, you can delegate parts of the hierarchy to other software, like Docker, for example. Um, which is, yeah, kind of nice. Again, it's going to be an API. If, if you ever looked at a Linux system on the CPU variety, you might have seen something like this before. Uh, like this before you have slash this and that secret with the controller name, and then you have the variety. <coughs> First, basically, to a directory where you have all the processes in. And with the new stuff, it's going to look like this. It's going to be a simple the controller part is quickly removed. The controller part is usually like something like CPU, CPU set in memory. And that's kind of basically similar, but it's very different and very great. So, anyway, I, mean, I think I really talked way too much about controllers, which I find it much more interesting, probably the most key part. Um, yeah, let's talk about something different. Um, System resolve fee. System resolve fee is a relatively recent addition. It's actually probably going to be the main part of the talk um, now. Um, what system resolve fee does 
This is a VNS resolution. VNS resolution is pretty far across. Uh, one might be the first. Uh, which is, uh, of course, I mean, I think you should pretty much everybody you know what DNS is, right? right? It's a service on the internet that translates how to make the addresses. Um, traditionally, in labs, the way how DNS is implemented is that there's a, a, a library call in the GMT that uh, <laughs> called the Kaiaka Info, a couple of alternatives for that stuff, but it's essentially all the same. We have possibility and then we'll directly go to the network, talk to you about the DNS server, resolve the connecting message on that. Um, that's pretty much like that, and uh, pretty limited. And uh, so as a result of the, we try to do the very same thing, but centralize it in a uh, persistent service. So that the libraries that they want to name, they don't do that directly, in terms of the network and query that, but instead they will talk to a system to resolve the. There are a couple of reasons why they should do that. First of all, it's the caching DNS result, right? Uh, meaning, uh, not every lookup you do actually goes to the network if you already asked it uh, 10 seconds before, right? Um, that's going to be my benefit, but it's a benefit. Um, it also has a product called LLNR. LLNR is something like DNS, like Microsoft came up with that. It's basically about doing automatic name resolution in the local network. Um, yeah, the more interesting thing though is that it does DNS. <laughs> Uh, that's what I'm going to talk about. So the NSSEC is something um, where people want to um, uh, set it down uh, as an answer to the internet. Um, it's, a, it's, a uh, like it's a set of relatively old standards. Like uh, I've seen people started um, experimenting with that 10 years ago. Like that. In 2010, six years ago, um, the roots of like the DNS groups that um, actually got signed to this DNSSEC for the first time. Um, the general goal of DNSSEC is to um, make sure that if you access www, um, I don't know, microsoft.com, then you actually end up at the microsoft.com IP address or something else, right? Um, of course, in this case, microsoft.com is not a particularly interesting case, but it's certainly way more interesting if you think about your, if you do a lot of bank transfer, and you really want to be able to talk to the bank and not to something else that just pretends to be a bank and for that collect the data. So, um, you know, I'm something to check it down there. It does not, um, it's authenticated in ask. It does integrity checks. Uh, it does not do confidentiality. Meaning that uh, um, if you use the you know, and hopefully you will do that in the all, um, it will verify that uh, the data you get back, like the mapping from the host to the IP address, is actually what it claims to be, and this can be cryptographically verified. But it will not protect um, uh, things uh, regarding confidentiality, regarding confidentiality, meaning that um, uh, people will still be able to see that you did that properly, right? So um, people will not be able to fake the IP address of the bank if you want to access the bank, but they will be able um, to see that you want to access the bank. So um, there's a change of trust. Basically, um, the root zone contains cryptographic tree, uh, the keys that are authenticated from uh, the TLD zone. The TLDs, like the top level names, you know those, which is like dot .com, dot .land, and dot .de, and dot uh, uh, .de, uh, for the various countries, and yeah, you know all those. Um, the TLD zones carry keys uh, which um, sign the domain to know that, right? So that if you go to the fossil network, um, fossil network is basically protected by the uh, keys that are stored in the org zone, and the, uh, the keys in the org zone are protected by the local root zone. And this goes recursively down, right? So if any name you have on the internet, you have to uh, find the keys in the, in the, uh, about that, so the signatures about that, and the other stuff there. So I don't really want to go too much detail on these that the NSF works with you, like, there are many talks about that, and um, I'm not the networks guy who really sits there and wants to talk about the details. I want to know if talk about the implementation of this um, in a specific So, um, one of the use cases of DNSSEC in particular is not just to do a host name to a um, uh, resolution, but also to carry a lot of additional information in DNS. Um, the guys behind DNSSEC are mostly in mind and letting SSH, TLS, and PPP fingerprints and other cryptographic um, uh, basic data. In the, in, the, in the DNS. The idea being basically that if you do uh, an open wrap route and connect to your bank, 
that um, they can ask, well, not only tell you, talk to that idea as to so get the data from the bank, but it will also tell you, um, and by the way, the certificate, like the TLS certificate for you, for the HTTPS connection that you're going to do, has this fingerprint. And then you don't need to authenticate the TLS certificate in any other way, because you already know, because um, uh, you have this authenticated DNS scheme, um, where you basically get a guarantee, yeah, cryptographically, I know, I may prove that this is actually really the fingerprint of that service. So it's, uh, in a way, it's a scheme how the variety of uh, certificate authorities on the internet, right, like, we all know those, um, I figure like how they're eminent and proud, is actually unified with the variety of the DNS on the internet. Um, and, yeah, that's the that's idea. Again, um, DNS is actually deployed around the world. It's deployed in the root zone. It's uh, deployed in most of the TLDs. Like .com, .net, .de, they all have it. Um, I was signed in 2016. It's also deployed by most US government websites. But other than that, not too many people, uh, not too many services are actually using it. So if you need your, like, uh, you can go to that website and it will actually tell you the current statistics how on the, the world's most popular websites, how many actually use the NSA. And interestingly, it's uh, 2%. I don't know that. Right? Facebook, Google, all these websites, they don't actually secure the stuff with the NSA. Which is interesting and which makes one wonder what happened in all those six years uh, since they when the signed the stuff. What's interesting to know, um, uh, Google runs the DNS server, because of the DNS server called 8888. Um, I think it's, I mean, it kind of became popular, I um, think, even in the, in the normal press, because uh, I don't know when, when, when Turkey blocked the internet for some websites, they didn't have a DNS um, information, and then um, they had to do on the wall, so I uh, hear this of that uh, Google DNS server. What's actually interesting about that Google DNS server is that I actually will validate the DNS server, right? So if you ask people in you, you send your query to that DNS server instead of the one that your ISP you provides you, then we'll do the full DNS validation. You have some some chance that it has not been manipulated, which um, was the good thing about it. Um, of course, it's also pretty useless, given that uh, uh, the communication between you and the DNS server is not necessarily in any way authenticated. Anyway, so um, regarding deployment, the websites are not very good at that. Um, the root zones and all these things are. Um, on the client side, Right? On my actual laptop that I used to practice the internet, the NSA accreditation is pretty much non existent. No OS implemented. Right? Not Android, not generic Linux, not Windows, not Mac OS, nothing does. And that's interesting. Right? Like, uh, how can that technology that has been adopted uh, by all the internet bodies, and, uh, by the US government, and by um, all these things, have not been adopted at all? Um, yeah. So, why is it all in the popular? So, the clients, they don't support it generally, as I mentioned. And that's really important because it's really hard to write. It's like this cryptography and stuff, and uh, it requires proofy things, and honestly, I think it's very complex. But the other members don't like it, right? Like, um, if you Google for it, you'll find actually um, quite some uh, harsh words by Mozilla developers about the bulky and second I'm ready to do it. And it makes it slow because uh, when you do a resolution of an internet to not hear this, it's no longer sufficient to just send one query to the DNS server, because the host can get that query back. You actually have to request the keys to authenticate this as, um, as well. So you actually do a set of requests and backup requests. So um, when every you website, it will actually take a lot of time usually until it gets to that step where it actually needs to be the connection to the HTTP server. So, yeah. On the server side, it's pretty nice to set up. Um, the, the, the way the protocol is designed is it's not automatic. It requires you to, to if you run the DNS server, you have to constantly keep it updated to, to resign things with, with the cryptographic keys. Regarding documentation, the specifications for it are quite frankly not good. Um, like, uh, I spend a lot of time implementing this, and um, the, the specs basically leave out all the really interesting part when it comes to the cryptographic proofs that what they're doing. So, yeah. And then there's the philosophical question. 
it is actually a good idea to replace this um, uh, like pluralistic certificate is a certification sorry, the system that we currently have, but you can get a um, uh, TLS certificate from quite a few parties. It would be really good to, to centralize it in one place, which is in ENS, which is this, uh, run by the IANA, which is like this international institution, which is effectively the US government. Um, it's actually it's just a really good idea to replace one by the other. But it's actually nobody really needs it, right? Um, it doesn't enable anyone to do anything who uh, wasn't able to do before, right? Coming back to this example with the with banking that I gave earlier, it's completely, you know, um, it's great if we can authenticate that first part of the, where the host name is translated to the, to the IP address, but also the, um, that doesn't buy anybody anything because the actual authentication happens after that, right? And the HTTPS is, is relatively secure. I mean, it's, it's, it's its own stuff, but it's, uh, ultimately the TLS stuff will authenticate um, uh, the fact that you're talking to the right server anyway. So um, if you do your banking transfer to an HTTPS server um, and do it via the NSSEC enabled transaction or without, it doesn't give you anything. Right? It will work the same way. So, yeah. So, after I told you basically um, how uh, not so awesome it is, I will still tell you that the method for result being as you get rid But, uh, I mean, that's a lot of competitors, IP6, right? IPv6, since 16 years or something or, or longer, is like the next big thing that everybody will adopt. Still today, um, except for maybe the Wi-Fi here at Foster, pretty much nobody uses IPv6 on a normal computer, right? It has been deployed on internal networks and then, uh, like telco networks and these kind of things. But on the wide internet, it's pretty much non-existent, right? Um, until very recently, for example, on Google, it had to reach uh, on its normal URL um, on an IPv6 address. So, um, now, for IPv6, there are actually really good reasons to have it, right? Because there are no more IPv4 addresses um, available, so one would assume that it creates quite some pressure for a human to adopt it. The NSAC doesn't have anything like that. Again, I'm pretty sure not so many people like to benefit from it really, because it doesn't fix anything. It's just, uh, I mean, close the gap, right? You can authenticate everybody, everything else on the internet, but you kind of put a NSAC would be good to authenticate that too. But ultimately, again, it doesn't buy anybody anything. Anyway, question um, first, um, when I have to ask it to yourself, is uh, should we actually support it? Right? Why an offer? If it's not a browser operating system, care. Why should uh, this the Linux care? Why should this be care? Um, it's a good question. But uh, I would say because the data is there, and because it actually is deployed in the various zones. So, um, you know, security is not, a, is not something um, where you deploy one technology and then you, you, you want. Um, it's really something where you try to secure as much and have, uh, that, that you can and you try to uh, secure the whole path. And then um, if one of those elements in the chain is weak, then you still have all the other elements in the whole path. Um, so, yeah. We're very excited to actually implement that and actually make um, you know, something that's uh, happening. Probably fine because I mean, with the system of user of the, like the focus that we really have with that is having some implementation that everybody really deploys, right? Um, which is, um, I mean, this is really the case of system view. What we want to do in system view is really about kind of things generic, right? We are not caring about a use case where you write something and run some three servers on the internet and maybe 100 servers on the internet. We really want something that can run on any Linux machine, like on pretty much anything by default um, that one system. And uh, to make this deployable by default, we have to make a problem. What is the private DNS servers, right? So um, I know like uh, many of you probably maintain their own DNS servers, and if they do that, they probably have their own private DNS servers. Like many, many companies here, like many big companies run their own private DNS servers. The private DNS server is basically that they came up with um, their own naming scheme that is completely different from the internet zone. Um, they um, establish it without registering it in the internet. Um, as long as you access this internal network of theirs, you can resolve all that stuff and see that though, if you use normal internet of C, right? If you use DNSSEC, then all that will break because um, suddenly everything that you do is cryptographically authenticated, it forms the top um, down, right? 
and meaning that if you have your own private uh, domain and call it foobar or something, and it doesn't exist in the real internet, then the real internet will tell you, I can prove you that foobar does not exist, and uh, then you cannot access the web. So if we want to make DNS deployable for normal people, then we kind of really have to deal with that problem. And that is a big problem because uh, like common Wi-Fi routers actually do accept the L private DNS stuff. Like in Germany, you have the Fritz box, which is a very, very popular commercial router. You can buy like, everybody uh, who has these in, uh, a Wi-Fi router. There's a good chance you have one of this uh, Fritz box machine. All of them um, you can say that L private DNS stuff and the private DNS stuff is called Fritz box, <laughs> box, right? And it looks like Fritz box, box offers. It looks like a like a domain, but it's not about the internet right now. Now, the irony actually about this one is that uh, the top level domain dot box got recently sold to some consortium in Hong Kong. It's really fun because uh, as soon as they offer uh, domains in that um, CLB, people can buy the domain and can make everybody's uh, uh, their route configuration on success. We'll see how that works out. But uh, it's kind of funny, but it's also, I don't know, it probably doesn't matter too much. But the key is these private DNS don't exist. And they probably exist in most ways how people access the internet, right? And it exists in many, many companies and it exists pretty much every home in Germany. So um, just ignoring the fact that they exist uh, and saying, hey, you can't configure your router anymore, you can't access the uh, routers and terminal website anymore, is really an, an option because Jason says, yeah, we're breaking the internet for everybody because we don't care because we think DNS is second point. But that's what we can't do that. So um, uh, we're just going to resolve the when we decide, okay, we want to do DNS sec and we actually want to make it something that can be deployed by default, we have to deal with the problem. We cannot take away the prior DNS. We came up with a couple of um, uh, strategies to deal with this. Uh, one of them being basically, uh, if you see the top box, top of the name, um, and we make the proof that it doesn't exist, we commit it anyway. Right? Um, We'll only do that for the top level domains, only for the bottom domains. Um, uh, we're not doing that for, for domains below that. So it basically means that as long as a router invents a CLT that doesn't exist on the real internet, everything's fine. But what the router, can, uh, what the router cannot do is invent a, 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 a domain below some other domain that already exists that is not a CLT. Like, for example, it's not supposed to define its own zone called foobar.rata.com. Because that would not be cool if you want to do an ex local extension of the, the public franchise to be that stuff, right? So yeah, um, we also know a couple of other strategies to deal with this kind of stuff, but it's really it's a big issue. Like if you want to prove that everything exists or not exists, and people have their own local stuff that doesn't exist in the real internet, um, another really nice problem is the fact that the yeah. answer was on the internet and the routers are awful. Um, they turn into uh, support DNS set properly. The Google ones, like the 8888 that I mentioned, is awesome. It does all these kinds of things. It's uh, very fast DNS set internally. And if you want to talk DNS set to it, right, we'll do that. But a uh, router is going to be that good. Right? The first box is actually um, a pretty good one. It actually allows you to talk DNS set, which is really weird in a way because they also violate DNS set by providing their own domain. So they basically say, yes. I give you all the uh, possibilities to authenticate all the domains um, that you ask for me, but no, I will also fake a domain for you that you cannot prove to exist. So it's a bit weird. But uh, most of the most of the DNS servers in other browsers are not the way it works. Like one of the favorite test cases I have is like uh, a, a Wi-Fi router that exists in my vicinity from a manufacturer of Belkin. Um, uh, it's so bad. Um, it's basically you ask me a question and uh, it says it takes um, like two seconds and then it tells you, yeah, um, <coughs> you can ask that. Um, and then it sends you back your own question again. But yeah, and not only the routers are crap, but also the ISPs are crap, right? In Germany, if you use um, Kongstar, which is the same thing as Deutsche Telekom, um, you get a, a, a DNS server that doesn't do DNS right? So um, if you if you if you customer to come on stuff, um, then you can do DNS um, which is kind of sad. And then there's a problem about captive portals. You know, captive portals are these things that if you if you use the Wi-Fi at a, a hotel or an airport or something and go to URL and redirects you to some 
weird for private sign waves to send you data and you can pay or anything like that. Those are captive portals. And the way many of them work, not all, is by faking DNS, right? So you type into your web browser the work, and it will um, actually um, give you back that result and pretend that it actually points somewhere else and it really does. So that you go to that website and you get this uh, weird crappy captive portal application instead. Now, in a DNSSEC world, that's never going to work because DNSSEC again is about proving the authenticity of data. And if these captive portals fake the data, then there's nothing to authenticate. It will always say, yeah, the data is valid. So, um, it's a big problem. The way I see it is, um, like what we have in mind with the system being in there is, well, um, Network Manager and Android on all these operating systems um, generally have code in there now that really tries to detect um, uh, capital faults. So what they do is, immediately when they got an IP address, they try to connect to uh, some well-known uh, website and uh, uh, check if something comes back that they expect uh, to come back, or if something else comes back. If something else comes back, they know that the traffic has to be with uh, assuming problems of that kind of problem. Um, this is deployed like, like in, in, in Fedora, for example, in the network manager. It will always, like, whenever you set up a, 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 a network connection, it will um, need to be connected to the Fedora service to see if it actually is connected to the real internet or some kind of call code. Um, our strategy regarding capital calls and DNSSEC is, well, as long as we are in this detection phase um, for DNSSEC, uh, for cut calls, we have to disable DNSSEC completely and put it everything. Which um, is not as bad as it sounds, I think. Uh, because the information that you have this captive protocol portal detection mode, or if you connect it to the real internet, is actually visible to the user in the network and in, in Gnome in the top right, like first, okay, this is weird. But this thing usually shows you, that uh, looks very ugly. Uh, uh, so this thing in the top right usually shows you whether you're connected to the internet or not. And uh, uh, this, uh, if you are in a captive portal, it'll show you some different icon. Anyway, so we have to deal with that kind of crap. Um, so yeah, it's just something we're trying to resolve that because again, we want to create something that actually is deployable in everybody's machine. And if we do that, we have to make a couple of compromises. One of them is we have to downgrade from DNSSEC operation to non-DNSSEC operation aggressively, right? If we figure out for some reason we cannot do DNSSEC, we have to do that. Which is uh, weird because uh, it opens everything up to downgrade vulnerability. Right? If an attacker wants to um, uh, make you go to your banking site and pretend that you are at a real banking site but actually are a fake one, then you can do that by first making uh, your client downgrade to not the NSX mode and then faking any, uh, passing any data you like because then nothing is going to get anymore. That's a quite a problem. But then again, um, when we don't do this, um, you can't just uh, access the internet at all anymore um, if you have one of those DNS servers that uh, uh, support DNSSEC. And uh, you can't bypass these DNS servers and go all the way to 8888 because of those private zones again. Because of private zones, if I connect to an um, uh, uh, internal network, for example, or some other internal network, or for example, my uh, home network, um, then I really want to be able to resolve the local zones that I work. So if I would bypass the DNS servers, um, that would be the fine. I would always go to the internet one. Then I would see the internet, but I would certainly not see my other network So, yeah. And the result be by default, when we turn this on, we will downgrade from DNS mode to non DNS mode automatically. Isn't that bad? It's kind of bad. Um, you can configure it also to not downgrade, but I think it's not, not everything blocks. Like, first of all, it's very elaborate checksum um, still, right? Because uh, if something that actually changed, we'll know. That's not too useful though. But uh, what I find more interesting is that it's the information whether um, things were authenticated or not is still propagated to the application, right? And if you come back to that use case that I mentioned earlier, where people want to, to end that as this HTML and DVD fingerprints um, in DNS, and things are still good because uh, um, the fact that something was authenticated or not is still passed to the application. Hence, if you use SSA, for example, to connect to some server, like, like to the Git server of GitHub or something like that, and uh, you try to authenticate the fingerprint 
of the DNS lookup actually matches uh, what's stored in the DNS. And you see that this DNS lookup that you did could not be authenticated, maybe because you have learned the DNS lookup of the DNS lookup. Then you will um, uh, uh, have to figure out a different way to authenticate, right? Which is the traditional way, by, for example, by showing it to you on the screen and asking you, hey, can you verify that this actually matches what GitHub claims that uh, should be? So I think that's really useful, right? Like it's it's um, it's the only way I think how uh, you know, say can ever be made something that is deployable end to end on the internet, right? Because uh, um, if we would do it that way, we would always insist um, on doing the asset. And basically means that at my home network, for example, I could not them configure my browser anymore. At my parents' um, home network, I could not internet the, uh, access the internet at all anymore because nothing would result because that would be nice uh, in that output. I couldn't use the internet at my girlfriend's um, home anymore because that being as well as also crafting doesn't do it. And so on. I'd rather secure un uh, access insecure internet Anyway, so I talked a lot about the uh, crap about um, uh, DNSSEC here. I know a lot of people actually love it. And uh, I got some more slides, and they're a bit random, but uh, I think um, uh, I talked about uh, lots of stuff that I want to talk about, which is DNSSEC. Um, hopefully, um, all that DNSSEC stuff will hit the distributions uh, very short, uh, very soon. And, uh, um, uh, after some testing, a couple of the cycles, we'll hopefully um, have Linux and this new uh, system to be the first one that actually deployed the NSX in a while um, on the client side. Um, uh, <coughs> but we'll see about that. Anyway, um, I think I've got eight minutes left or something. Um, uh, before I cut the other slides, I think uh, I'd rather do uh, QA here because I'm pretty sure that some people have uh, other questions than about the NSX or something. So, um, uh, can we continue playing with the microphone? So, um, yeah, if you have any kind of process, if you have anything, um, feel free to stop. Yeah, so I just want to say that I'm going to stop. Right, thank you. I think this is great. I'm a DMS screen, so I appreciate this. Um, I guess you've probably been following the work on DMS privacy on your ATF. I'm wondering if you have plans for uh, TLS encryption in uh, Resolver? TLS encryption, yeah. Um, like, um, I don't know, I, 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 uh, I, the way I see it is it's DNS and it's not really about um, uh, privacy, it's really about the Could the ones who leave be, be as quiet as possible? We still want to do this right here. Um, please, try to figure out. No, I don't have any plans to do DNS. Okay, I mean certainly that's that's the traditional DNS view is that DNS is public. Uh, certainly in the in, in recent years with, with pervasive internet monitoring, I think that that common wisdom has been changed. And uh, there's a really good you probably read at RFC about the the dangers of DNS and, and efforts to, to make it more right. So I, I I know you've got a taking on a big chunk of work here and probably aren't looking for more things to do. But if you've got a, a bucket list of things in the future, I would encourage you to at least consider uh, looking at DNS privacy. Honestly, it would actually be super easy to add because, I mean, we do support TCP transport for doing DNS queries. And if you do TCP, you can also do TLS. Um, it's, it's not that big of a difference. We also already bind to web providers anyway because we have to do authentication, right? Um, and it would actually be easy, but... Uh, um, and the thing is, like, um, at least none of my servers uh, support TLS based DNS. So um, I'm mostly interested in the generic case. It's kind of the, the motto of the entire system thing, right? That we always care about the generic case, we always care about making something that can be turned on by default. And I have my doubts that TLS based DNS lookup is something that is very commonly supported. So, anyway, another question. Okay. Some time ago, you wrote about um, that you want to change the way um, the base system and the limits um, and the packages are put together using containers um, also right, um, done by system D. Is that like, still a thing? Are you working towards that? Is there a time frame? Uh, well, I mean, so, so basically, the basic operating system and the component that we worked on kind of delivered already. The problem is that the distributions um, have not gone to that yet. And the reason for that is because uh, um, I didn't find the time to actually uh, push that. So. But uh, quite a few, so I mean, just a little bit of the background of this is that, uh, like, uh, in the Disney uh, uh, context, we work with making so 
persistent, uh, stateless way. You basically can build up the system by simply having a user and nothing else around. Uh, so that the first time you do it, it will automatically populate that seeds that are, uh, so that you have a complete uh, uh, system uh, to work with. Now, um, uh, basically, if you, as long as you run a really basic system that you guys have consistently in UMC and a couple of other really basic stuff, all that really works, right? I can um, uh, boot up my system easily with my user again, but populate it as you get a password database, all that will be placed afterwards, all the missing things that like run and stuff, all of the stuff that's all of good. But uh, that's absolutely not sufficient, right? In real life, uh, people don't run operating systems that basic, that put something on top of an operating system, like a factory or my SQL, or whatever else they want to run on it. And those generally um, don't support that mode, right? Because it, it means that people would have to buy a philosophy that services um, shall be uh, bootable without having any dependence that can see and then fall back to default. And now, uh, first of all, nobody bothered with patching with them the questions. And um, secondly, it also means that the philosophy about allowing this kind of system would be something that the, that the various services also actually have to buy into. So it's, it's not just a technical question or something of, of, of work, but it's also about convincing the people that this is actually goes. And so far, I, uh, we didn't follow up that. But we have so much trouble in life to come. But uh, I would absolutely welcome it. And I know that some distributions do have, um, if, if they would love that, um, at least uh, take parts of it. Like, uh, like for example, uh, the rest of the public project, we do some parts of it. Uh, I don't think that if, the, if this would be on the, the big scale, but it's really much of what's left now to do to actually take that reality. It's not so much something that we can do, it's something that the distributions have to figure out. If they actually want this, then I think they should, but they have to do work. Um, and they have to be in such hard stuff as they actually want to do. Uh, I think we have two minutes left, so. Well, Sorry. So, where does the uh, crypto in system E come from? Sorry? Where does the crypto come from within system D? The crypto, we use the use the uh, Okay, perfect. And uh, are you obsoleting G C then? Are you what? Obsoleting G C. Are you working towards uh, getting rid of G C as your uh, no. solution? Uh, like we are not a standard library, we're just doing stuff. It's like I don't know if I don't know that the question is why you see evidence about this kind of thing. But uh, like the system we use APIs like crazy. We we don't uh, um, focus on the strategic and context APIs or 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 basically actively use the UC extensions and uh then we would change some of them like we can I see one last question, anybody I want to Well, no website. 